Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a very uh, nice evening and a good day yesterday. Um, excellencies, fellow scholars, policymakers, practitioners, international lawyers. I'm very pleased uh, to be here and to be chairing uh, this session. I'm not only pleased because this is going to be a fabulous uh, panel, uh, but also because I just finished 360 kilometers of cycling through the Baltic, so I'm happy to be here in one piece and exploring your lovely, uh, lovely uh, three countries. Um, we're here to discuss the refugee crisis, and I put that in inverted commas, the refugee crisis in Europe also uh, in inverted commas, and whether the plight of refugees can be addressed within the existing international frameworks. And here, of course, we focus specifically on the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 protocol at its base, but also inter other international and regional and in the context of Europe human rights law, as well as the EU common European asylum system, the EU uh, asylum acquis, and other agreements such as the EU-Turkey agreement and so on and so forth. Of course, also customary international law, general principles of international law, as well as the whole body of soft law. So in fact, international refugee law is a broad uh, area and the existing international legal framework is actually quite extensive, albeit detailed in its specificities. But I would also add the whole realm of policy. Yesterday we heard uh, from one of the panelists on the early sessions that policy, humanitarian assistance, isn't really international law or is not considered international law. But I'd just like to make a point about that. Policy making can become international law. Policy making is international law or could be international law in the making. And therefore we really should stay very closely attuned uh, to it so that international law suddenly doesn't develop while we were looking at existing international law. On the 19th of September at the UN General Assembly this year, the two texts will be adopted, one and both focusing on solidarity, one on refugees, one on migrants. There are questions about whether they add anything new. Have we had enough of statements about solidarity? Where is the action? And if we require action, what action uh, should be taken? I haven't seen the texts of these documents, uh, but the UNHCR has reported that they are groundbreaking. Um, however, it should be noted that much of the action parts of the declaration, at least on refugees, have been deferred until 2018. So, what does this uh, say to us? Is this a new debate? It seems to me that this is not a new debate, and perhaps not even a new crisis. Every time there is an unwanted movement of persons, particularly when they move outside their region of origin, we move to crisis language and we look beyond existing instruments uh, to tackle these problems. This is not to say that the existing instruments actually provide the answers to all of the challenges. But I don't recall in the 1951 convention, although it started as a regional instrument, that refugees were to be protected in their region of origin. And I think this is one of the fundamental understandings now of how refugee law should operate, at least, though, at least by states uh, further beyond uh, the crisis center. Judge James Crawford yesterday stated that every generation has its crisis. Well, I think mine was the Bosnian conflict in the 1990s. I studied it in international law at, at law school. I then went on to work there for two years. And at that time, you will remember, borders were also closed uh, to Europe. But eventually, Germany in particular accepted over 500,000 refugees from the Bosnian conflicts, albeit on a temporary basis, under a temporary protection regime. And of course, today in 2015, 2015-16, uh, Germany has accepted over one million uh, Syrian refugees. So potentially, we've made progress. Germany is also considering them as refugees should they be able to establish their case. And with the context of Syrians, I understand the recognition rate is exceptionally high. Being responsible for the legal events around the 50th and 60th anniversaries of the 1951 convention when I was both le a legal advisor and UNHCR's chief of uh, the legal section, I have to say that I'm not optimistic. 
Aldis Levnis, uh, the president of the Latvian Constitutional Court, mentioned yesterday that the supranational, that there, that there is the nature of the current challenges are supranational and that they cannot be solved by one state alone. He is right, of course, in relation to the refugee uh, crisis. And his words are, in fact, mirrored almost word for word in the preambular paragraph of the 1951 Convention, a hint that the founding ideas behind the 1951 Convention understood that uh, international commitment, solidarity, cooperation was required. But I'd also suggest that when things cannot be solved except collectively, it can lead to inertia uh, as well as states taking limited action while relying on other states to take uh, more action. And of course, international relations scholars have a whole range of things to say about that. However, the Convention, like many international treaties, imposes international state responsibilities, not collective ones. Resettlement and funding assistance are considered to be in the realm of government goodwill rather than obligations. Some, of course, argue otherwise. There are some arguments in particular around the EU, but donor states in general do not accept that when they're providing resettlement places or funding for humanitarian assistance, that this is an obligation as opposed to a gesture of humanitarian goodwill. I'm hopeful today that with our excellent lineup of speakers, we will not only challenge the actions or policies of some states, potentially we may even praise the actions of others, but we may also offer some views on the way ahead. And just one last thing about uh, so-called wishes. We heard yesterday that the opening panel were asked to give their wishes for international law. And the only thing I'd like to say that often in times of crisis, it is the time when wishes can come true. And sometimes it takes a courageous person to put forward a blue sky idea and then others will follow. So at least in this context, I think we should, the floor is open to have uh, broad ideas uh, to see where we may head next. So while I'm not optimistic, I am not discouraged. So, over to my panel. Uh, I have asked them to speak for between eight and ten minutes. We will then uh, have an opportunity for the other panel men members to ask a quick question or a burning question of the person who's just spoken. And after the three panelists, we will open up to the floor. That should give us around 30 to 40 minutes of interactive uh, dialogue uh, with the audience. Uh, the first speaker is the Commissioner, the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Nils uh, Muisnek, um, and we're very pleased that he's uh, here uh, with us. Our second speaker will be Pro Professor Elspeth Guild uh, from Radwin University in the Netherlands and Queen Mary uh, University of London. And our third speaker will be Professor Boldazar Nagy, uh, from Eertvos Lund University or Central, Univer Central European University in Hungary. And the great lineup means we will start kind of with the broad Council of Europe, narrow down into the European Union and have a case study on Hungary. I'd also invite you to think about other practices uh, and challenges that are going on uh, in the rest uh, of Europe. And the only final thing to say is I have apologies from Madeleine Garlic from the UNHCR, who is unable uh, to uh, be here and sends her apologies. Uh, this is regretful. Um, although I was UNHCR's chief legal advisor for the last uh, five years, I am unable to speak in that capacity any longer, so I will not be able to make any clarifications uh, on positions of UNHCR or otherwise, um, but I'm intrigued to hear if any others uh, have views at the relevant uh, time. So without further ado, over to you, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm very pleased to be here. Latvia is my home turf. Uh, the last time I was in this conference hall, I was telling my colleagues here, there was Latvia's most well-known poet, Uldis Berzinch, reciting his translation of the Koran in sing-song, and there was a dervish swirling here. So it was a, this is a slightly more sedate uh, environment. Uh, migration and refugee-related issues are, have been at the top of my agenda since I assumed uh, my job a little more than four years ago. 
um, I've tried to focus on a number of core issues on pushbacks, on detention, uh, on the situation of uh, particularly vulnerable categories of people, such as children, uh, victims of torture, victims of trafficking. Um, and increasingly, I'm trying to raise the issue of, of refugee integration and migrant integration in my country work. I've done country work on these issues in more than 20 countries, um, and I have a feeling uh, I will have to do it until the end of my mandate. Um, <clears throat> you said that every generation has its crisis. I was told when I assumed office that every commissioner has his crisis. The first commissioner for human rights, Alvaro Gil Robles, had Chechnya as his crisis. Thomas Hammerberg had the Georgian-Russian war. Uh, I have more crises than I, than I care to mention, uh, and migration and refugee issues is just one, one of many crises. Um, the main point I would like to stress is that the ongoing migrant crisis uh, demonstrates how weak and fragile the human rights regime is in Europe. Uh, I would submit that the international and European legal framework is adequate. Uh, the problem is an implementation, huge implementation gap. Um, and I'm very glad that Elspeth will be talking about EU law, uh, and I will, but I will talk a bit about uh, the Council of Europe's role in this and Council of Europe uh, law. Um, and I will suggest that a lot of work needs to be done to bring uh, Council of Europe standards uh, to life more effectively. Um, I think the importance of Council of Europe standards has increased over the last few years in the context of the inability of the EU um, uh, to manage the situation effectively and in a human rights compliant manner. Uh, and I think the case law of the court um, has become more and more relevant. Uh, the Strasbourg court, I think for many, is the ultimate remedy for, for the many uh, human rights violations that uh, people encounter in this area. Uh, my predecessor uh, began uh, the work on intervening in the European Court of Human Rights as a third party on migration and ref refugee related issues and I've tried to continue uh, that work. I've intervened on uh, three occasions regarding uh, five cases relating to important uh, asylum and migration issues. Uh, and these cases all pointed in my view to important um, and very serious structural problems that need to be addressed. Uh, the first case my predecessor intervened in was uh, in 2010 in MSS against Belgium and Greece uh, about Dublin returns. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to look back to say that six years ago uh, you, had this, uh, you had this case which basically showed that the Dublin system was fatally flawed. If 90% of irregular entries into the EU back at that time or a little bit earlier were coming through Greece and you can't return people to Greece, then how can this system function? Uh, and that judgment, uh, the landmark judgment, put a stop to Dublin returns to Greece. Uh, but the Dublin system has limped on uh, ever since. Um, the second case uh, in which I intervened um, was in 2015. Uh, it was actually two cases against Spain, uh, <clears throat> ND versus Spain and NT against Spain. It was about collective expulsions of migrants from Melilla uh, to Morocco, a practice uh, which appears to have been going on for some time, and the Spaniards were getting away with it. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, uh, international attention began to turn to this. Uh, the third case uh, has to do primarily with Hungary, but there were two cases against Austria, uh, SO against Austria and AA against Austria, about Dublin returns uh, to Hungary. Uh, and these three cases uh, highlighted uh, a number of major human rights issues. Uh, the inability or unwillingness of member states to protect uh, asylum seekers from refoulement. Uh, many, many instances have been reported to my office uh, in recent years, uh, <coughs> often accompanied by collective expulsions, which are prohibited under Protocol 4 to the Convention. Um, in 2015, uh, the EU's Fundamental Rights Agency came out with a report uh, noting an increase in pushbacks, especially from Bulgaria, Greece, Hungary, and Spain. And these pushbacks put uh, lives of vulnerable people at risk, and it makes uh, the right to asylum devoid of meaning. Uh, the second major issue highlighted uh, in our third-party interventions is excessive use of asylum detention. 
this was a new world for me. Uh, I've visited many, many places of asylum detention all over Europe. These are new buildings built with EU money. Asylum reception centers are generally run down. Detention centers are brand new, well funded by the EU, and they're spreading beyond the EU with EU funding. Uh, and these are the most desperate places in Europe. Uh, they're often worse in prisons uh, because there are no activities, no education, and people can be held there often for extremely long periods of time uh, in substandard conditions. Uh, the uh, detention is often unlawful or arbitrary, uh, and it's a major facet of the criminalization of migration, which Elspeth has, has worked with my office on um, in, in a number of different contexts. And this has fed the xenophobia which we have seen uh, rising its ugly head in, in many areas in Europe. Uh, the third major human rights issue I think that these cases demonstrate is the lack of domestic remedies um, for redressing human rights violations, uh, due not only to detention, uh, but uh, uh, also these other uh, human rights issues I raised. In my intervention in the Austria cases, uh, one of the issues I underlined was the lack of effective judicial review of detention orders in Hungary. Um, <clears throat> and detention in Hungary is a very nasty phenomenon. I remember visiting a detention facility there. When I entered the grounds, asylum seekers were being led like a chain gang with their hands tied in a line. <clears throat> and there are a whole bunch of them there. And one of the most poignant moments in my work was talking with the people through bars and one guy with an IZOD shirt, good looking young guy said, what am I doing here? I'm an asset manager from Syria. Why am I in jail? <clears throat> it was really heartrending. Um, more worrying, I think, is the detention of migrant children uh, with their parents uh, in conditions that often violate Article 3 of the, con of the convention. In July uh, of this year, the Strasbourg court uh, ruled in five judgments against France uh, finding violations of Article 3 due to bad conditions of detention uh, in Metz and Toulouse. Um, and this isn't, France isn't even the country with the, the, the most or the worst conditions. Um, uh, finally, a major problem is, uh, even if there are judgments of the court, uh, is a partial or non-execution of, of the Strasbourg court's judgments. Uh, execution of MSS against Greece is still pending before the Committee of Ministers. Uh, and this prolonged non-implementation is a challenge to the, to the whole system. Uh, in the European Court's recent annual report, uh, they noted an increase of cases pending uh, for more than five years. 55% of all cases at the European Court of Human Rights are pending for more than five years. Uh, the average time to close a case is four years. But there are some countries where it's much longer. In Russia, it's 10 years. In Moldova, it's eight years. In Ukraine, it's seven years. Um, <clears throat> so what's the way forward? Uh, the way forward is to improve domestic implementation of the convention, to improve the efficiency of pr procedures uh, before the court, and there's a lot of work that's been done on that, to improve supervision by the Committee of Ministers. But most of all, I think it's to treat migrants and refugees as rights bearers in need of support and empathy. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a very good uh, pressy of uh, some of the challenges. I'm very pleased to hear that you mentioned detention as well, which is often considered a, a single issue that is kind of a side because it, it, it focuses so much on human rights law. And you, you often find declarations, etc., not mentioning detention. I didn't see detention mentioned, uh, for example, in the UNHCR press release about the, pen, the upcoming uh, uh, global compact, etc., but I, I haven't seen the text. Uh, do our esteemed colleagues have any questions? Yes, Elspeth. Uh, I would like to ask one question of you, Niels, and that is about your role as the commissioner on the interface between law and policy in the field of refugees and the protection of migrants. How do you see this developing, and what do you see as the mechanisms that would improve your capacity? More interface or less interface? or a different kind of interface? It's true. I, a lot of what I do is advocacy work or diplomacy, uh, shaming, showing good practices, 
uh, trying to build political will where there is none. Um, I think the legal tools are interesting, but they're often not as important as the political tools. Um, where I think there's a big gap is I have excellent cooperation with UNHCR. Um, and every, every time I work on this issue, I hook up with them and I try to say things that they cannot say and do things that they cannot do. Uh, cooperation with the EU is bad. Uh, I have excellent cooperation with the Fundamental Rights Agency, with the Ombudsman. Uh, European Parliament is becoming more active and interested. The Commission is not interested. The Commissioners are not interested uh, in cooperation with the Council of Europe uh, in, uh, on this issue. Uh, they're very sensitive to our criticism of the EU-Turkey deal. They said, this is a political issue, stay, stay clear. Uh, so I think to really have an impact, we have to leverage our relations with the EU, which has so much money which can be a force for so much good, but on migration issues, it is often not up to par. So this, would, this is a single thing, I think, which could lead to the most progress in this area, in, in Europe at least. I have two short oh. questions. In fact, you can answer them as yes or no. <laughs> uh, the first one relates to the recast of the Dublin Excuse me? The recast of the Dublin Declaration 2016, uh, it retains all the principles and adds the corrective mechanisms. Do you think it will improve on, in any way on the situation which was condemned by MSS? That's question number one, yes or no. Second, detention. I fully agree with you on the evaluation of the detention situation in Hungary. I'm not addressing that. I'm addressing the principal question whether you believe that any detention of asylum seekers where there is no with a view to expulsion, because their procedure is ongoing, so we don't know whether they will be removed at all, whether that's compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 5.1.F, even if the reception conditions allows that. I don't think that the fact that we have an EU rule in itself can overrule the European Convention. So do you think it's compatible, or don't you think it's compatible? with the European Convention. Detention of asylum seekers without the view of expulsion, and once they are already in the country, so it's not a, about preventing them entering the country. No, the, the, the Dublin system, uh, I'm surprised it's still alive. Uh, but what's interesting is when you talk with policymakers um, around Europe, they say the Dublin system is not only about returns and the first point of entry. The Dublin system is about family reunification, the Dublin system is also uh, the legal framework in which relocation within the EU is taking place. So how do you, how do you uh, not throw out the baby with the bathwater? <laughs> but it's clear that this first point of entry is totally unsustainable. I, I, I predicted three years ago, if there's not European cooperation, where will we end up? Where will we end up if we have national approaches to migration? It's, and, it, and it's virtually happened. Uh, first is, you will have many fences around Schengen and within Schengen. Uh, <clears throat> second, you will have many unhappy migrants and asylum seekers stuck uh, all the way between Turkey and Germany. Uh, you will have, and finally, uh, Greece and Italy will be left to fend for themselves, uh, which will lead to huge, huge human rights problems there. And we're, we're about there. Uh, <clears throat> regarding so I'm looking at it realistically, Dublin, there are enough countries that want to keep the patient alive, although it's comatose, uh, and I have a feeling it's going to limp on for a while yet. Uh, detention, um, alternatives to detention are not used almost anywhere. Uh, and there's no reason to detain people, especially for lengthy periods of time. You can, you can ascertain whether or not you can return them to their country of origin in a couple of weeks at max. You don't need to detain people for a year and a half. Uh, or in the UK where there's no limit, there's no time limit on detention. You can detain people for up to five years if they're not cooperating. There's no point in it whatsoever. Um, it's inhumane, uh, it doesn't help the integration of these people, and you don't need to do it to ascertain where they're from. Um, so 
what is a human rights line, as a last resort, only with a view to return, uh, but it's never, it's always used, it's more often than not used as a first resort and not as a last resort. All right, with that, um, we might move on to uh, uh, Professor Guild um, on a broader perspective, or a narrower, broader, depending on you, where you're sitting, uh, in relation to the EU. Thank you very much, Alice, and it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's always an honor to be on the same panel with Niels, and I'm always delighted to hear what you have to say about how things look from the perspective of the Council of Europe. I'm going to talk about the refugee crisis and the refugee law crisis from a perspective of the European Union, which is um, the field I'm most competent in. And the first thing that I would say is that in international law, and Alice, you have made reference to what is going to happen on the 19th of September, there is no crisis in international refugee law as such. The 1951 Refugee Convention is not under a sustained attack. The UN institutions uh, and the member states of the UN will be confirming it next week in New York. The additional protocol which lifts the temporal and the geographic um, restrictions is not under attack, it still exists. So the crisis, if we're looking for a crisis in refugee law, will need to look elsewhere. Of course, in international law, the Refugee Convention, and now flanked by the <clears throat> Convention Against Torture, flanked by the Convention Against um, Disappearances, the prohibition of non refoulement uh, is now a question, while well, there's a discussion in international law as to whether or not it has become uh, international customary law, but it's certainly not under attack as a principle. The impact of international law when it comes to refugees is particularly acute in that it provides or purports to provide rights to individuals who are in need of international protection. And it, in some parts of the world, runs into very substantial political heavy weather. So what has been happening when we look at the European refugee crisis, which really began to gather force about a year and a half ago as a so-called crisis. And the first thing that we have to take into account is that refugees are, of course, persons in fear of persecution on one of the convention grounds or torture under the uh, Convention Against Torture or uh, arbitrary disappearance under the, uh, the convention of that name. And they are in search of protection, and in their search for protection, they have at least a presumption, if not an entitlement, in international law to cross international borders with or without permission to do so from the relevant state. In 2015, we had, according to Eurostat, and there's a little handout which you've got, I've given you some of the statistics, uh, about 1.23 million asylum seekers in the whole of the European Union. Now, Germany continues to claim it had 1.2 million asylum seekers itself in 2015, but according to the common counting procedure of Eurostat, the statistical agency of the European Union, which requires data to be provided on a consistent manner, so it's comparable across the 28 member states, Germany had under half a million asylum seekers. So where that other half a million came from is not entirely clear. It's a matter of the way in which the Germans count. Since then, from uh, 2015 
to halfway through 2016. If you look at the Eurostat statistics, you will see that we are well on our way to another 1.2, 1.3 million asylum seekers this year. As a colleague mentioned to me um, from a trip that she made to visit uh, reception centers in Berlin in November last year, the colleague said, well, of course we can deal with this. This was um, the Chancellor's uh, great statement last August. Of course we can deal with this. But they said, what we need to know is, is this the new normal? Is a million asylum seekers in Europe now the new normal? And in the last 12 months, I think the whole of the policy world has had to come to terms with perhaps this is the new normal. We have a regional war going on in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya. And last summer, when we had a substantial number of um, asylum seekers coming almost exclusively, not exclusively, but primarily from Turkey. If we reflected slightly on why that happened, we would have to express substantial concern that perhaps Turkey was going to be engulfed in this regional war. Now, we are seeing evidence that perhaps the fears of those refugees of a year ago and the continuing fears and the continuing flight are not entirely misplaced. We have not been seeing the same kinds of massive outflows of asylum seekers and refugees from temporary protection in Jordan and, of course, in Lebanon, where almost half the population are uh, Syrians in uh, receipt of some kind of protection of one sort or another. So what kind of a crisis is there in the European Union? As became completely apparent in um, August last year, the crisis is a crisis of reception conditions. The member states are under duty, they've been under duty since 2003 to provide reception uh, conditions for all asylum seekers who arrive on their territory, whether or not they are subject to, or could be subject to a Dublin procedure. And the member states who received asylum seekers did not want to take up their responsibility to fulfill their obligations under the common European asylum system to provide reception conditions. To avoid having to provide reception conditions, the issue of arrival of asylum seekers was transformed into a Schengen borders issue. And a number of member states, starting with Germany and Austria on the 13th of September last year, <coughs> reintroduced temporary border controls in an attempt to try and force their neighbors, as they saw it, to step up to the plate, provide reception conditions in accordance with the directive and to behave like proper EU member states. That, of course, only further complicated the issues with routes becoming more complex if people are fleeing uh, torture, persecution, etc. Uh, a few border guards aren't going to stop them. We do have of course, examples of extraordinary violence being carried out both by state and para-state entities in Bulgaria, which explains perhaps why there have not been substantial movements of refugees through Bulgaria. But we certainly hope that is not going to become the new normal in Europe. The what is the consequence of this? Where does this so-called refugee crisis end? Well, it, first, it would appear that uh, most of the European Union has accepted that a million plus asylum seekers a year will probably be the new normal until this terrible regional war in our part of the world comes to an end and the most important aspect for our foreign ministries is try, to try to prevent further conflagration in the region. 
and to find some kind of way out of where we are. We have extremely important actors, including Russia, including the United States, including France, including the UK, who are involved in this regional war. It is extremely problematic. The images of Aleppo indicate exactly why asylum seekers are fleeing, and the current turbulence, turbulence in Turkey is not unrelated. <clears throat> so, where do we go with the common European asylum system? Well, if the issue is one of reception, and of course integration is the next step, family reunification and integration, but the first step is reception, how do we go about convincing all the member states that they must participate in this reception, um, in providing proper reception conditions, leading to proper asylum determination procedure, proceedings, leading to proper and coherent integration into the host communities. And I think that's where we are now. There is uh, there's been a huge effort since October last year to try and get relocation going in the European Union with 160,000 spaces supposedly being opened and at the moment the number is pathetically low in terms of internal relocation. Why do people, refugees, still go from one member state to another member state? Well, although policymakers present this as rocket science, if we think of this from the perspective of the asylum seeker, if when you walk down the road, people yell obscenities at you, throw rocks at you, children uh, spit on you in the street, you know you're not welcome. You will try to go somewhere where you can take your children and you will be safe, where people offer you a welcome. The great slogan of 2015, Refugees Welcome, what countries were refugees actually welcome in? Where were people willing actually to come out and assist refugees? In that context, the involvement of civil society is central. I'm going to finish just coming back to Alice's comment on um, good, uh, what happens in a good crisis. Well, the European Commission has a saying which is never waste a good crisis, and they're not wasting this crisis either. And what the direction of the European Commission is in respect of this so-called refugee and borders crisis, a, uh, a reception conditions uh, crisis which has been displaced into uh, a so-called borders crisis, is to create two new institutions. They want an asylum agency which will gradually be advising and uh, assisting national asylum determination authorities in decision making to get coherence, and an EU border guard to try to overcome the um, reflex to try and use borders as a mechanism to push the reception uh, of asylum seekers onto a neighboring member state. Both of these proposals are well underway. The EU border guard will be primarily a, um, a sea border guard. The land border guard is not under serious consideration at the moment, but it seems to be moving ahead. The proposal is moving ahead quite quickly, whereas the asylum agency is perhaps uh, slightly going ahead slightly more slowly. I have given you a sheet on which I'll just take you through uh, why I've given this to you, because uh, it explains why there is or isn't a crisis. So if we have about 1.2 million asylum applicants every year in the European Union for the duration of the current regional uh, war which is going on, is this a problem? Well, Eurostat tells us that we normally issue about 2.5 million first residence permits to third country nationals a year. Of that, uh, about 25% are to refugees, asylum seekers, people who get temporary protection of some kind of durable kind. That will go up undoubtedly, but we're not talking about statistics which are impossible. If we can issue uh, 2.5 million first residence permits to third country nationals, is a further million 
a problem of exponential proportions? And the answer to that is probably no. And then if we look at who we really, really, really don't want, and this is the reverse side, this is from Frontex, the latest statistics from Frontex, and sadly trying to copy, any, copy anything from Frontex reports means that it goes into formatting disasters, so the table is not perfect, but the totals are perfect, and we see that, in fact, we only expel less than 50,000 people a quarter, less than 200,000 people a year. We only identify that number of people who we actually want to get rid of. And if you look at the table, the vast majority of people we really, really want to get rid of are our neighbors from Albania. And then, of course, we have small numbers of Iraqis, uh, probably questionable whether they are uh, expellable at this point, and Ukrainians. And on that point, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Elspeth. I, I think that's the first time I've actually heard it described as a, a crisis of reception, which I think also links into some of the comments yesterday about economics behind uh, crises and the High Commissioner for Refugees in his explanation of why so many arrivals uh, into Europe, he said it was almost a perfect storm. You had, in fact, the funding levels uh, from EU countries at least remained at the same levels they had, including during the financial crisis leading up to uh, the current uh, exodus of uh, Syrian refugees uh, from the region. Um, but the numbers and the, uh, and the demands became uh, greater. Um, one of the questions I always had during uh, last year um, was why this was why the response was being left to immigration authorities, where in Europe they are usually uh, border controls, whereas where were the civil protection, the civil defence individuals that would move us, shelter us, for example, if there was an earthquake or there was a fire in Spain or Portugal during the summer months, etc. And that shows to me a, a severe lack of political will that there is the capacity to do that. If not, then I think at some point we're all in trouble um, when a disaster uh, hits a particular country uh, in Europe. Um, but that was one of the real uh, issues that the wrong, it seemed to me that those less equipped were being tasked um, to deal with uh, some of the, uh, the frontline responses, at least, and in the context of reception. Do either of you have... Uh, all yes, both? Yes. Both, great. I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on the trend in the EU uh, on one issue. If relocation and this whole relocation program, to me it represented a, a pretty significant shift that member states were yielding sovereignty on an issue that, uh, which they had jealously guarded for many, many years, asylum uh, <clears throat> issues, or at least sh willing to share more sovereignty uh, with the commission. Do you see a similar trend on integration supports? Uh, Twelve years ago, uh, I was in the Latvian government and I participated in the first meeting of EU ministers responsible for responsible for migrant integration. And I have a very distinct memory of Otto Schilly, who was then Minister of Interior of Germany, sitting next to me, saying to the Commission, this is not a union competence. You have no business telling us how to integrate our immigrants. Do you, uh, do you see a shift uh, towards more shared or more union competence in this area? And how, how, where, how quickly is it going? Uh, no, no, for you, sorry. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much, Niels, and a very interesting question. Uh, one of the difficulties about the term integration is that, and I'm sure you will recall this from that meeting uh, with Otto Schilly and the others, is that there are quite a number of member states that have used the concept of integration as a mechanism for exclusion. So it is a matter of tests, of exams, of sanctions, of taking away residence rights if people don't pass certain thresholds. So instead of it being a mechanism of integration into society, it becomes, it has been used in some member states as a mechanism to exclude those who are 
less, ed less well educated, so they have difficulties passing tests. Somalis are the classic. No formal education for the better part of 30 years in Somalia. So no experience in passing tests and exams. Um, the, the outcomes for Somalis in these integration tests tend to be very bad wherever they are in the EU, and it's part of this whole problem of what do tests do and who can pass them. People who are well-educated can pass tests here. That's what we did to prove that we're well-educated, but um, etc. So you have a series of problems about the ways in which a number of member states have used the idea of integration as a tool of exclusion of certain groups and to keep them uh, out of access to certain kinds of social benefits, etc. On the other hand, you have um, within the EU institutions, at least someone has been thinking quite carefully about what kind of statistical information do we need about migrant integration. And if you look at the way in which Eurostat has compiled its statistics on integration of migrants, it's about are migrants being employed? What is their level of employment and income in comparison with nationals of the member states in other EU countries, housing, etc.? So instead of it being, well, we're going to exclude these people, it's about what do we need to do to promote uh, how education, housing, access to health care, access to education. So there's quite a different focus, at least in terms of the collection of statistics. Now, if the member states cede sovereignty to the European institutions on integration, what kind of policies will we get? Will we get the um, uh, persistence uh, of these very exclusionary policies, which are in operation in a fairly small number of member states, uh, as opposed to laissez-faire or more inclusive policies in other member states? Or is the Commission preparing already the ground to say, well, we need to actually move forward in ensuring that third country nationals who receive residence permits are achieving the same kinds of results as citizens and other EU citizens? Paul Diaz. It's in between a question and a comment. It's about the German statistics because I was pondering upon your question as well, and I think there is a partial answer to that. Germany has a double system. One is the easy system, when they register the new arrivals, and that's around a million for last year. But many of them had no chance to submit their application. That's why Eurostat has that 440,000 figure. And this explains this year's very high figure in terms of first applications, because the people who arrived to Germany last year are submitting their applications this year. So if you look at the statistics, you will find out in Germany there were more than half a million applications this year, whereas the new arrivals is obscure. We don't exactly know how many new people came to Europe. We know that the, the, West, uh, the Eastern Balkan route is not so much used, but, and we know that roughly 200,000 came through Italy but we don't exactly know how many came because the asylum statistics do not reflect how many new arrivals there are in 2016. So that's why, why um, these, there's this, this, this um, non-parallel between the asylum seekers and the new arrival statistics. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, I do know about the double system. You know, the, the Germans tell us all about this endlessly. It's the justification for why their figures don't fit. We set up the Eurostat system. The Germans were at the table. Everybody agreed that this was going to be how we count. So this is how we count. The other problem about the German statistics is you have um, the disproportionate representation of one small Balkan state in the asylum statistics, which skews everything. And we can talk about the statistics until we're blue in the face, but we know that there is a specific kind of issue which will only be resolved if we actually get serious about implementing the right of establishment, which should have been applied to under the EC uh, Albania agreement two years ago. Great. Nothing like statistics to get us all excited. 
<laughs> Sorry, I did write a paper uh, a few years ago. I gave a public lecture on the numbers game and how difficult it is. I'm not a statistician, but it seemed to me that UNHCR was always indicating how big the numbers were in order to achieve funding and how large the crisis was, whereas others were advocating, oh, it's not so big in comparison to the, the number of, uh, for example, citizens within the European Union, and therefore it's not really a problem that countries can absorb them. So the use of statistics is always uh, fraught uh, with uh, difficulties, and almost regardless of the year in which they're counted, hopefully they will uh, be counted um, and come out in the statistics. Um, so, moving on to Baldazar, who will uh, give us perhaps an, one of a, a case study. And I, the question I have even in advance is whether this is a sui generis case study or whether there are trends uh, across uh, the region. Um, did you want the stand? Yes, it's easy. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Alice. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that so many came to a nine o'clock forum as a founder of the society, that's very reassuring. And it will be a tradition that we all account for our first crisis, and mine was 1956. We went to the cellar, and that revolution in Hungary was followed with a 200,000 exodus from Hungary. So we are prepared to talk about that. Now, the, the paper, which I'm going to summarize in 10 minutes, um, is about Hungary in the European context. My assumption is that you cannot explain the changes in the law from the law. So I try to go beyond that and create a frame for it and interpret what's happening in Hungary, which might relate to what's happening in the EU. Certainly in the form of the question, does Hungary meet the demand of the loyal cooperation or sincere cooperation with the EU member states and the EU itself? You will find that paper published, and I have a handout which might reach you soon. So, why Hungary? Hungary is an external border, and it has this idiosyncratic relationship to the common European asylum system. And also, it reports that it had 177,000 applications in 2015. But if you look at the numbers, how many cases had been decided on the merits, it's in the range of 5,000 and the actual protection given to persons in whichever form is to 502 for last year and 253 for this year. So Hungary has this dual role that we have inflated numbers in terms of asylum seekers and very little protection being given to those in need. So what does Hungary in fact do? And there I offer a theoretical approach based on three uh, strands of academic uh, interpretation, what is sacratization? Uh, if you look at the Hungarian discourse, you will find that it's a classical sacratization discourse as described by Aspet and Didier Bigo and Jeff Huismans, where the actor in the speech act uh, and also his actual acts creates an other which is threatening, poses it as a threat to security, and then undertakes to protect the society by exceptional measures. And this is exactly what's happening in Hungary. The second uh, theoretical background to the paper is majority identitarian populism. And in a paradoxical way, it is the government, which is this populist, uh, claiming that there are others um, who are threatening and who are not serving the public good and therefore the representative of the populism is, or, or the population is there to act. And that other against the elite, against which the populist steps up, is frequently the European Union and Brussels and the Commission and the proposals there. And the third theoretical stand which uh, uh, fertilizes this paper is crimigration. That is that trend in the academic literature which observes that more and more um, criminal law tools are used in an immigration context, which once used to be seen as two separate branches of the law. And migrants, especially those who are in an irregular status, are penalized for those acts with pen penal tools and penal instruments. And the key aspect here is that there is no rehabilitation intention 
In normal criminal law, you punish the criminal in order to lead the criminal back to society. Here, penalization is only aimed at retribution. Um, so that's the theoretical uh, background. Now, what were the changes which make the Hungarian position so idiosyncratic? I am just referring to the changes introduced in 2015 and 16. So you see how a state turns away from a decent refugee receiving country to one which is defending itself and as it claims, Europe from the asylum seekers. First, declaring Serbia a safe third country among others. Now the absurdity of that move can be understood if one considers that 800,000 people came to the European Union through Serbia. If Serbia it was a safe third country and the rule was to be applied, it would mean that 800,000 cases should be decided by Serbia. Now, it's politically, obviously, a nonsense, even if it legally was tenable, but it is not tenable legally either. The next move uh, uh, was a set of laws which entered into force 1st of August, shorter deadlines for application, less assistance, deprivation from appeal rights. Then a third wave of legislation shortly thereafter, entering into force on the 15th of September, criminalized the crossing of the fence which had been completed by 15 of September between Serbia and Hungary and later, months later, between Croatia and Hungary. So it became a formal crime. You can be in prison for three years simply for having come across the fence. So-called transit zones were established. These are containers at the border in which a special procedure is conducted which entails detention for a maximum of four weeks without judicial control. That's the core of the new border procedures and the classical secretization move. A crisis situation caused by mass migration, that's the formal name, can be declared and was in fact declared. Um, the next cruel step came uh, in 2016 when all integration assistance was deprived or taken away from the recognized refugees and those beneficiaries of subsidy protection. And the last, so far, step uh, entered into force this July. There is now a rule according to which if police intercept someone eight kilometers from within the external border of the EU, police is entitled to arrest that person physically and push the person through the fence. No judicial review, nothing a coercive removal to the other side of the fence, which in fact is still Hungary. A few meters there are still Hungary. So these are the most important legal changes which took place in 2015 and 16. And now I offer you a matrix within which you can interpret these changes. I claim that the moves of Hungary can be described as denial and detention, secretization, deterrence, obstruction, punishment, free riding, lack of solidarity, and breaching the law. And now going through these elements, which I sort of listed already, um, the secretization discourse has been mentioned. Maybe I quote you one uh, statement of the Prime Minister of Hungary delivered on the 15th of March this year. He said in a very public speech, it is forbidden to say that today we are not witnessing the arrival of refugees, but a Europe being threatened by mass migration. It is forbidden to say that tens of millions are ready to set out in our direction. It is forbidden to say that immigration brings crime and terrorism to our countries. That's the Prime Minister speaking at a major national holiday. So it's a, a classical secretizing speech, denying that the people are refugees who arrive, although we very well know they are. Um, um, the creation of the parallel reality that is replacing the figure of the refugee with the irregular migrant who is illegal and threatening is reflected, for example, by gestures like the Hungarian news agency never using the expression of refugees and the hashtag always being illegal migrant. Parliament had a debate on subsistence migration when they in fact wanted to describe the situation of the uh, arrival of asylum seekers. As to deterrence, detention, of course, acts as a deterrent, as does 
and as did the dire treatment of the asylum seekers in 2015. Some of you might remember the images at the railway station when thousands were stuck at different railway stations in Budapest without any government assistance. Uh, the totally unpredictable behavior of the government, sometimes blocking them from entering the trains, other times allowing them. That's how 400,000 people crossed Hungary. Last year, 200 of them were actually delivered by the government to the Austrian borders. The fence itself works as a deterrent as the criminalization of the crossing of the fence did. And not only the asylum seekers were deterred, but also the NGOs assisting them. I mean, you had something to say about that. Um, and the UN functioner also, who is responsible for the harassment of human rights workers, had an, um, a very critical report about his visit, about the actions against the NGOs working with the asylum seekers. Obstruction. Of course, declaring Serbia as a safe third country is a classical obstructive move, preventing the asylum seeker from access to procedure within the EU. Uh, but you very rightly spoke about reception conditions as the key, key element. What did the Hungarian government? It shut down the largest well-established reception center in October 2015, and instead replaced it with, with uh, a tent camp. Uh, now, the new most recent development in the term, in the uh, flow of, of, or in the series of obstruction is that before the transit centers at the border of Serbia and Hungary, hundreds and hundreds are waiting for weeks to get into the transit center because the capacity of the transit center is artificially limited. As to punishment, Detention itself is a punishment. I and mean, Manfred Novak has declared that, that uh, and, and we all, not all of us, but many of us understand that, being detained is a punishment, even if it is not a criminal law sanctioned formally. Banning from the Schengen territory is a punishment. I mean, people who are removed under a safe third ground rule from Hungary are at the same time banned from the Schengen territory uh, for a number of years. Human smuggling rules have been tightened, so even the start of a travel towards the border is considered to be human smuggling. Free riding, lack of solidarity. Um, of course, the fence does not stop asylum seekers coming from Turkey or from Afghanistan or from Eritrea. It just reroutes the way in which they read, uh, reach the European Union. The reluctance to receive Dublin transfers is a classical free riding gesture. Refusal to participate in the relocation and the resettlement uh, mechanisms of the EU, in fact, attacking it in the court, is also an expression of the lack of solidarity. And the last in that sense is the, the, the series is the referendum proposed by the government to be held on the 2nd of October, all related to the, the relocation scheme or it's, it can be debated to what it, actually it is relocated. And my last matrix box is the breach of the law. I think we can argue that the Geneva Convention is being breached, Article 31 and 33, about non-penalizing irregular entries or non refoulement might be breached. The campaign, the secretization campaign, may contradict to the Convention Against Racial Discrimination. The EU law has certainly been breached in many ways. The Commission sent an administrative letter in October 2015 and started infringement procedures in December. So we will see the outcome of that. And as a matter of fact, a number of domestic laws were also uh, violated when the whole setup was arranged. For example, there should be a public consultation of the bills, bills were not really offered for public consultation for more than eight hours. So what is then the conclusion? The conclusion is that Hungary presumably is not performing its duty of loyal cooperation within the EU. Uh, and um, it created a parallel reality. Instead of contributing to the public good of protecting asylum seekers and refugees, it is pretending that there is a threat to Hungary and the EU, which it is defending. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the words uttered claiming that it's a defense of the European Union, in fact, is uh, a contribution to destroying the European Union. Thanks.
Thanks very much, uh, Boldazar. When you were talking about inflated numbers and little protection, I was thinking about a, the excellent book by Matthew Gibney, who's an, ethic, an ethicist, um, and it's called The Politics and Ethics of Asylum. And I've always kind of thought of uh, protection a little bit like a hand organ. I'm not sure whether the analogy or the metaphor works, but it seems that the practice has been the more, you, more refugees you receive, the less rights they receive. And this used to be the Africa and still is the Africa model. Um, and the less people that enter, the more rights they are granted. And this used to be the Europe uh, model. And now there seems to be some uh, shift between uh, those two. But I think one thing we haven't discussed, and I hope uh, when we turn over to the floor, uh, questions of state sovereignty um, which are, I think are prevalent throughout, but also state responsibility of individual state responsibility under these conventions, including, for example, Serbia, that prior to uh, a few years prior to had recognised one or two refugees in the entire number of refugees that had passed through their uh, territory. I don't think simply because countries are outside the European Union um, that everybody, you know, that there's this kind of a lower tier level of uh, states that are party to the Refugee Convention and a higher tier, that would be a very uh, slippery slope uh, to move down. And maybe that's been part of uh, the drama uh, also within the European Union, but also outside uh, the European Union. We have uh, 20 minutes left. I just wanted either of you one quick question, or should we go hand over to the floor? Great. I've got such a compliant panel, aren't they wonderful? <laughs> All right, the, f the floor is open. Yes, please. Morning, my name is Ana Salinas, University of Malaga, Spain. Thank you for all the presentations, the fantastic pre presentations we have had uh, by the panelists. I have two short questions for two panelists, Ms. Guild and the Council of Europe Commissioner. First of all, um, one of our colleagues, an Italian academician, has used his right to address to the uh, EU institutions, so he had a written official response by the legal service of the Council of the European Union concerning the legal nature of the agreement signed, the declaration signed among the member states gathered with the, in the framework of the Council of the European Union and Turkey. And the official response clearly stated that it is not an international agreement. But if we go to the uh, Vienna Convention of the Law of the Treaties, uh, and taking into account that the title doesn't mind so much, and that the most important thing to be taking into account is the intent of the parties and the obligations set in the text, um, all heads uh, of the legal services of the EU member states foreign affairs services have unofficially accepted that this is an international agreement and this is legally binding for all member states. So it would, be, it would run counter some uh, um, um, obligations uh, in the field of international human rights law or international refugee law, but also it would put aside the European Parliament zone, so it would run counter Article 2 18 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, so I would like to have the opinion of Professor Guild. And second, because the Commission has uh, recalled the uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, case law, the European Court has been very clear in expressly stating, rolling in their opinions and their uh, judgments that the perception and the way in which the court considers the protection system established by the uh, Geneva uh, Treaty, the Geneva Convention, is more protective. So the court has been very generous in interpreting the protection of asylum seekers' rights. Should this be, uh, would it be in a near future, a hot point of, uh, of uh, relationship between the Union and the Council of Europe, in particular taking into account the, the re rejection of the accession agreement. Uh, till now, there has been a balancing uh, case law on the part of the European Court, quite politically correct, and trying to not to fight against uh, and not to go into EU law review. 
So this is a very hot point right now because many, many requests will go to the European Court. If this system continues like that, the Great. feeling, uh, uh, just one point, the feeling we had is that the, the European Union as an integration organization is in the hand, is a prisoner in the hands of the lack of political will of its member states nowadays concerning this crisis. Just these two short uh, questions. Thank you very Thank much. you very much. I'll take a, a few, three or four questions to start with. The lady straight behind. Uh, thank you very much, Sara Poli, University of Pisa. I have a question for the Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, you spoke about the um, cooperation of the EU institutions with the Council of Europe and uh, you gave us a fairly rosy picture as far as the Parliament and the Ombudsman is concerned and a negative one as far as the Commission is concerned. And I was wondering, what is your expectation on the Commission? What the Commission could do more considering, uh, you know, the problems of competences, since this is not, you know, we are not talking about exclusive competences and therefore uh, the treaty uh, still has to be complied with. So what, what could the Commission could in addition to what it does. And the second question concerns the European Court of Justice and the way uh, the court could use the Charter of Human Rights, uh, the European one, of course. Um, do you think that there are promising rights in the Charter, such as the right to good administration, which could help in improving um, the situation from the procedural point of view. I mean, the courts could impose on national courts to interpret in a certain way the EU legislation so that uh, it is more um, favorable to those seeking asylum or those who are, are the object of a return uh, decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, over here, could I ask you to keep your, as far as possible, because I know it is complicated and some things need a, uh, an entry uh, as short as uh, possible so we can reach more people. Yes, yes please. Yes, good morning. Um, Daniel Toda from the German University of Administrative Sciences. I have a question for Ms. Uh, Guild. Um, I'd like to challenge your proposition that the uh, Geneva Convention was not under attack. At, at least in the German context, we've seen how many prominent constitutional lawyers, including former presidents of the Federal Constitutional Court, have been arguing the past months that um, not only Germany was not under the, the obligation to admit all these people to assess their protection claims into the German territory, but that doing so had been even the worst breach of the rule of law in the history of the Republic. And this seems to me to be a serious challenge to the obligations under the Geneva Convention, which they seem to interpret more like a border protection instrument than as a human rights instrument. Um, so I, I think that in, in certain contexts there is really a danger that the Convention is being challenged as such. Great, thank you. I'll take one more, but I don't see, yes, in the center. If uh, microphone coming from the... Your left. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Joris Larek from the uh, from Leiden University. Just one quick question for uh, Professor Gild. Uh, I just was wondering about the, you said it was moving fast with the new um, uh, plans for, for an EU Coast Guard. Uh, what would that add to what uh, the, the, the Mediterranean mission uh, EU now for Matt Sophia is already doing? And even assuming if it worked perfectly well, wouldn't that just mean uh, migration flows would just reroute again through the land borders? And there you said there wasn't a lot of progress in terms of, of um, beefing up uh, capabilities. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the first and a few questions were for you, Elspeth, if you wanted to start. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much for very interesting and um, uh, thought-provoking questions. Uh, to the first one on the EU-Turkey statement of March this year. Well, there's just a, you know, a, a huge problem here. If it is an agreement in international law, then it is in breach of the EU treaty. So you have the EU institutions and the heads of state uh, and everybody involved engaging in an illegal activity in terms of entering into an agreement with a third country which fails to comply with the requirements under the Treaty in European Union. So, you know, what can I tell you? 
It may be an agreement in international law. If it is, we have a constitutional crisis at the heart of the EU that somebody's going to have to sort out. Now, of course, the whole business was a very, very short um, uh, stopgap because the EU-Turkey readmission agreement had a delay provision on its application to third country nationals, i.e. Syrians, uh, which was lifted from the 1st of June. So, in theory, the readmission agreement can be used now for Syrians to send them back to Turkey. Uh, I, as I understand it, the whole business has come to a complete halt on account of um, the current turbulence in Turkey. Uh, on the question, I'd just like to say one thing about the application by the Court of Justice of the European Union of the European Charter, the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights. In the field of immigration, asylum and borders law, EU immigration, asylum and borders law, the Court of Justice has been really reluctant to apply the charter anywhere except in asylum. And so most of the references in the field that I watch closely are in judgments about asylum law and some interesting developments of the charter there. Uh, I think the ABC case in respect of the Netherlands and how do you prove you're homosexual uh, is perhaps the most interesting one where the court found that for an official to receive, for instance, a personal video of you having sex with somebody of the same gender, is a breach of the right to dignity, is a really interesting development of the right to dignity, which in many member states was considered to be you know, not much. Anyway, uh, to the question about the Geneva Convention under attack, I think that there are member states where the Geneva Convention is under attack. Uh, that's certainly the case, but when you look to what's happening at the UN level and the consensus of the signatory states to, to the convention, I don't think we're looking at another protocol. I don't think we're looking at any amendment. I think we're looking at, in fact, what's going to happen on the 19th of September is a huge convergence of the international community to support the norms of the Refugee Convention. So yes, um, that, that there are certainly some voices out there that national application in Germany has been highly problematic and it's all too terrible, uh, but I don't think this will transform into any actual practice or any effort to try and reform the, the, the Geneva Convention. And I think the 19th of September has been established to make it entirely clear to a small number of states who might like to change it, Australia I think is another one, uh, that this is a no-go area. On the question of the Coast Guard, uh, will a new institution make any difference? Well, one of the difficulties about, one of the issues which has been much criticized about SOFIA and this action in the Mediterranean, and now we've got NATO in there and the Americans are using their aircraft carrier in the Eastern Mediterranean, yeah, is we have got a framework, a legal framework, which is extremely unclear between the use of military operations and the uh, legal regimes applicable to military operations in supposedly acting in a humanitarian capacity with what is a civilian activity, which is border control. And I think that um, while one may wonder whether or not a, an EU Coast Guard is the way forward, it was the Italians that have been blocking this for the last 10 years. Um, one of the things which might be helpful would be a legal regime which clarifies in what field of law this actually lands. And I think that uh, one of the most important things to watch in the development of the Coast Guard um, directive, assuming that it actually goes ahead and it is adopted, is to make sure that it is placed strictly under control, under civilian law provisions, and that it is part of administrative law as all border control should be. Elspeth made my job easier, so I don't have to address all the issues that were raised. Uh, what do I expect of the EU? 
First of all, I expect the EU to enforce its own rules. The EU has a lot of good rules on reception, on returns, on, doesn't enforce them. And when you ask them why, they say, oh, it's a very sensitive political issue. And, and, and if they do enforce their rules, you can't find out about it unless you know somebody very high up in the commission because it's all so sensitive. So the one message I've been saying to the EU is you have limited competence in human rights issues. But why don't you excel where you do have competence? Why don't you enforce your own rules and be a, a world leader in these areas? So that's one thing I expect of the EU. Uh, a, second, a second thing would be to human rights-proof policies within the EU, but also in external relations. Within the EU, to revisit certain regulations and directives, you know, for example, on detention. You know, detention for up to a year and a half is totally contrary to human rights law. And, you hear, here you have the EU, EU law representing the lowest common denominator among member states, uh, and it should revisit this and, and other similar provisions. But also not to create human rights problems in neighboring countries by externalizing border controls and, uh, and exporting detention practices which are contrary to human rights, uh, but to use its clout uh, in countries of origin, for example, uh, places that are sources of migrants that don't have protection needs uh, so that you can return people to places like Morocco or Algeria or so on and so forth, uh, but also to provide assistance to countries uh, that are uh, sending many people um, and, uh, you know, to use its diplomatic weight uh, to stop, uh, to participate in halting the conflict in Syria. Otherwise, it'll pay the costs in the long run anyway. Um, but the EU has done some great things and they fund a lot of Council of Europe programs. They offered to fund my office. I said, no thank you, that would be the end of my independence. Uh, <clears throat> um, so they, they do do some good work, but I, at the highest political level, there is not a huge interest in, in cooperation on human rights related issues. Their politics trumps human rights. Um, regarding the, the Court of Justice and the relations between the courts, I'm not the best person to assess that, uh, but I would really suggest you ask this of Ineta Ziemela, uh, from uh, former, Latvia's former judge at the court, uh, who is uh, one of the co-organizers of this conference. My sense is that they communicate a lot with each other and try not to come out in open conflicts, um, especially on issues that are not that important. When it comes to uh, non-accession of the EU to, to the European Convention, I think that was the European Court of Justice basically saying, we're not going to be under anybody. <laughs> so, so they found a very interesting legal and political, ar more political than legal argumentation, basically saying we, we will not submit to the authority of another court. We will cooperate with them, but do not try to make us subordinate to this court. Um, but my sense is that they're very sensitive to, um, uh, you know, to, to conflicts uh, in, in interpretations of, of laws and, and that they try to avoid them as much as possible. I think there is some potential in EU law. I think um, in the Charter, uh, the right to good, administra good administration and, and issues surrounding effective remedies um, at the domestic level. Um, here I, I find the work of Emily O'Reilly, the EU Ombudsman, with regard to Frontex and trying to push for a complaints mechanism and accountability within Frontex, because Frontex, or if you have an EU border uh, agency, is going to be confronted with many, many thorny, thorny human rights dilemmas. So accountability mechanisms, um, uh, appeals procedures, uh, and so on will be very, very important. Uh, and I have a feeling that we will see certain aspects of the Charter brought to life uh, as, as the EU assumes more functions and, and, uh, on border control. Thanks very much for uh, responding to those uh, questions and for the questions. We're at time, um, so I won't uh, take another round. Of course, there's plenty more to say and to deal with uh, on this uh, issue, um, and perhaps a proposal to the European Society of International Law, whether there isn't scope for a research forum or, or the like uh, on some of the specific issues coming out of uh, this panel. But, in this context, and especially for new scholars, uh, I'd just like to say make sure you're speaking to a wide range of actors and receiving a wide range of views because 
what seems to be happening to me is the polarization of the human rights and refugee advocates on the one hand and certain other actors, uh, politicians, uh, certain groups, etc., on the other. And it is important that uh, we are able to come up with rational uh, and objective arguments to confront uh, uh, some of those uh, issues. Judge Crawford made a comment on the first day that his wish uh, was for more stable uh, responses. Um, I wanted to ask him whether he meant more predictable in the context of stable. Many of the things are stable. The 1951 convention has been around since, since 1951, the UNHCR earlier uh, than that, etc. cetera. Um, but one of the intriguing aspects of how international law develops for me is that in, in dr drafting and crafting the 1951 convention, it is clear that economics, security, and the numbers of refugees were high on the agenda during the negotiation phases. And the convention is structured in such a way that it actually allows slight variations, for example, to the right to work for refugees based on their levels of attachment, based on a number of other criteria. The convention itself is quite complicated. But the main way they sought to allow states to take some varied approaches was through reservations. But of course, once you've entered a reservation, the 51 Convention doesn't allow you to uh, withdraw it. So we have a similar situation as 1951, and some, and some countries in Europe, as we know, are struggling with their economic and security issues, but without potentially the flexibility within the Convention to allow uh, this to happen um, in the way that it happened uh, in the past. And in, in, for example, there were reservations by Italy at the time of the 1951 drafting because they had 200,000 refugees that they said they couldn't possibly give them all the right to work at the time, given uh, the collapse of the economy after the Second World uh, War. But the answers, I think, are still in these documents. Um, and it's just a way uh, in which states and others, and especially civil society and academics and scholars, are able to play their role to influence, to put forward good arguments, etc. And it was a pleasure chairing this panel and to be amongst old friends who I haven't seen uh, for a while. And since I've had a break from Refugee Matters for about nine months now, it was very interesting. So thank you very much.